welcome to Sports Management Podcast, where you will hear interesting sports management professionals share their stories, experiences, and passion for the sports management industry. I am your host, Marcus Philipsson. Welcome to episode 103 of Sports Management Podcast. Before we start, I just want to ask you all for a very small favor. If you like this podcast, please subscribe to it on Spotify and Apple and give it a five-star rating. It would help me very much in getting it visible to more people out there. Thank you. Moreover, this episode is sponsored by InSport Education, the online business school for sport. The best way to elevate your sports career, except for listening to this podcast, is to take part in InSport Education's courses and programs. InSport Education is offering sports management podcast listeners 10% off all of their courses with the code SPORTSMANAGEMENTPODCAST10. Click the link in the description below and elevate your sports business career today. Now, today's guest is David Robert Harry. He is a teacher and the author of Why Some Sports Are Better Than Others. So why do people prefer some sports over others? There are many reasons and we discuss all of them. Get ready to learn why team sports are more popular than individual sports, the importance of fan engagement, why sports need to optimize time, the importance of objectivity of outcome, gamification, and much more. David Roberts Harry, welcome to Sports Management Podcast. Thank you very much, Marcus. It's nice to be here. How are you doing? I'm doing great. And I've been looking forward to this uh, conversation for quite some time. We have been talking back and forth, and I'm really glad that we're finally here to talk. Yeah, absolutely. And I just want to say congrats as well on the um, the award that you received at the sports podcast. It was third place in the sports business category. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Thank you very much. I got uh, very happy about that. A lot of people voted. So for those who listen that they voted, thank you very much. Yeah, great stuff. I continue to bring on uh, the best guests possible that I can. And I'm really happy to talk to you today. For uh, the people that uh, might not know who you are, you have written a very interesting piece among many other things that is called Why Some Sports Are Better Than Others, which is a very catchy title. So, uh, you know, before we jump into that more in detail, can you tell the listeners a little bit about yourself and your background? Yeah, absolutely. Um, So I've always done a little bit of writing. I actually work as a teacher, but I have an interest in sport and various topics that I've written about in the past. Um, I have a few close contacts who work in the sports industry, uh, in sports business. And so I have a connection with that world and regularly have lots of conversations about it. And I wrote a piece um, for a contact that I had in that world and sent it to them. And they encouraged me to try and, and get this piece out in some way. Um, and then uh, you got in touch with with one of my contacts uh, who works for Deloitte. Um, and she said, oh, why don't you you know put this piece across to him, see what he thinks. So you were kind enough to, to give it a read and agree to have a conversation about it. Yeah, definitely. And I did read it and it was very interesting. And it's, uh, as I said, it's a, it's a catchy title and, uh, you know, maybe a little bit uh... controversial. Yeah, controversial. Exactly. And uh, I like that about it. That was very much the idea of, of the title was trying to sort of grab the audience, I suppose. Um, and so, yeah, why sports, are, why some sports are better than others. And the big disclaimer is that it's all about better as a spectator sport. So essentially what I'm trying to do is highlight some criteria that I feel um, are what capture the reasons behind why some sports appear to be more compelling than others as spectator sports. Because we look across sort of societal sporting preferences and we see that there are very clear winners and losers. There are some sports that have this massive fan following, huge amount of TV exposure and huge amount of money being poured into them, whereas others have comparatively extremely little. And so I was trying to weigh up what are the key criteria that have kind of led to this disparity? Um, and so I suppose it happy for me to kind of jump into them. Yes, for sure. Go ahead. So, so number one, which is a really big one, is um, objectivity of outcomes. So we look at all the world's biggest sports and they all have objective goals. So scoring a goal in football is an objective outcome. A touchdown in American football, an objective outcome. A basket in basketball, an objective outcome. And minority sports or much smaller sports tend to be those that have more subjective outcomes. So such as 
gymnastics is an incredible sporting spectacle. And when you watch it, you may think, why, why is this sport not more popular? Why is this not on television all the time? And it's the fact that the outcomes are subjective. Who wins is determined by a judge as opposed to any sort of specific objective outcomes. And that detaches the, the viewer from being able to engage with it as deeply as they might with a sport that has that objective outcome. And we see that across all the most popular sports. They're all objective. On top of that, sports need to have, so the second criteria is that they need to have complexity and detail in those sports. So if it was just about objectivity, then the 100 meters and the long jump would be the world's most popular sports. And they're not because they are too simple. They don't have the level of nuance and detail and complexity um, that sports like football, basketball, rugby, things like that have. And the, the higher the level of detail and complexity that the spectator is able to engage with, then the better their experience is. And that comes on to criteria three, which is uh, that the critical action has to be accessible. And um, what this means is that, so having complexity and detail is very important in terms of improving that viewer experience. But if it gets to a point where there is action that is critical to following what is happening in the sport, that is beyond the grasp of the viewer, then that has a profoundly negative impact on their experience of it. So if there is, for example, if you're watching cricket and you're fairly new to it, and there's an LBW, I don't know if you're familiar with cricket, it's not very big in Sweden, I guess. No, I, fair enough. Well, exactly. No, so I you don't might know be in this is. situation. Yeah. <laughs> which is a, it's a key thing which would lead to a wicket, um, but it's quite nuanced and quite complex and beyond a lot of uh, viewers' grasp if they don't have much experience with it. They might see this happen. It's a key turning point in the match, but they don't have any access to it because they don't understand it. And so um, I've coined the term the threshold of bafflement which is the, the point at which you are then baffled by the action. It is no longer, you're no longer able to engage with it because you've crossed this threshold beyond which you don't understand what's going on. So those are my three criteria. They're objective outcomes, high level of detail and complexity that can be engaged with, um, but that the critical detail and the critical action has to be accessible. Yeah, those are really interesting. And on the first one, the objectivity of outcome. I mean, there are also hybrid sports. For example, if you say some of the martial arts, boxing or mixed martial arts, you can have the more subjective with the judges, but it can also be a knockout or something that is a clear uh, objective outcome. So how do these, I understand that soccer is more objective than dancing or figure skating. But on, I mean, on this uh, rating scale of the best sports, where do these sports come in that they are, they have both? Yeah, definitely. And that's a really, really good point. And you can argue that all sports have both to some extent. So with the, the fighting sports, it does appear that, uh, well, th this may be a kind of um, an opinionated thing that I'm saying here, but that a knockout in boxing is a more satisfying outcome than a split decision. And certainly a, a unanimous decision is more satisfying than a split decision because we want to be sure that the, the right outcome has happened. And if we look at football, which we might think of as being a really objective sport, but then look at interpretations of laws, things like offside and VAR, it shows the incredible lengths to which sports are going to make sure that they remain objective by having something like VAR to try and cut out any subjectivity that could get it wrong. And still there are situations where it's, it's very difficult to determine. It comes down to a call. And that's why people get so passionate and so cross and so angry about it when they feel the decision has the wrong decision has been made. Because it's as if that objectivity has been kind of stolen from them in the sense that there is an objective reality to what has happened in the match, but it's been interpreted incorrectly in a subjective way. And that has removed that object objectivity from the sport. Interesting. So on the accessibility, critical action, and the uh, detail and complexity. You gave an example of squash, for example, versus tennis, because now we have compared sports that they are further away from each other. But tennis and squash are both racket sports. Closer, they play their ball. They are, of course, different. But then you, me you mentioned that uh, in the squash, there might be difficult to follow the ball, more difficult than in tennis. And for example, I'm working in ice hockey. And for someone who's not very much into that, it goes very fast. The puck is small and black and might be difficult to follow. So how does that play into the, the fandom of the, those sports and the interest for the, these sports? Yeah, definitely. I think 
again, the ice hockey one's really interesting. And the, the tennis and squash is a good example because we're looking at two quite similar sports. And squash is one that has never achieved a big, um, I suppose, well, it's never got the money that tennis has got. It hasn't achieved the fan engagement and things like that. And I think you're right. It's that element of the ball is very small and travels very fast. And so as a viewer, it's quite difficult to engage with the complexity that's going on. So the detail in what's happening in each shot, you can see where the ball ends up. But in terms of tracking its path and things like that, you're missing out on a lot of the detail that's involved there. And ice hockey obviously has a similar problem, but has overcome that because it does have a very big following. Perhaps I don't actually know where ice hockey would be in relation to um, other sports in the world in terms of following and engagement. Do you know where it might rank in terms of so I know in in the Nordic countries and like Sweden and uh, Northern Europe, it's, I would say, in top three in uh, most of the countries. It's uh, football is the biggest one. And then they are usually, let's say, third, fourth, fifth. On a global scale, I, it's lower due to, you know, in Asia and Africa, it's uh, very, very rare that you play. So that's probably more down. But uh, in, in Northern Europe, I would say it's uh, fairly popular. Yeah. Okay. And I would... I would suggest that, because I make another point in the piece about how culture perpetuates popularity of sport, because if you have a culture in which a sport is participated in and, and watched um, due to whatever circumstances, for example, in Canada, the Nordic countries and Russia. Yeah, where, I didn't mention Canada. It's like religion in Canada. Canada and the US, of course. Yeah, definitely. And so you have, historically, you have conditions that allow for that sport to be played. And so people play the sport. And by participating in the sport and watching it because of that sort of the geographical factors that produce the conditions, it means that people are able to understand and engage with that level of detail. So then they become like yourself, who has a, an in-depth knowledge of the sport. And therefore watching that, despite the speed of it, they're able to follow it and engage with that high level of detail and complexity. So their experience of it is therefore enhanced. Whereas if you have people that are outside of that culture, and haven't got that kind of background that allows them to access that detail, it's more challenging. And therefore, it's harder to break into different markets. So the fact of having a culture that gets people involved early and means that people kind of view it by just the nature of the society that they're in, it means that they build up sufficient knowledge to then enjoy the sport more, and then that produces a, a kind of virtuous cycle. And I think we have a similar situation with, because you're saying about it ranking sort of third consistently, so rugby in the United Kingdom, for example, would be a similar situation in that in certain countries, it's very popular, it's quite high up, but it doesn't break into world markets. And that's a sport that's quite complicated. The laws are quite confusing. And so again, if you don't have a culture that is already in place where people naturally engage with it and understand it from a, a young age, then they're less likely to be able to access that nuance and complexity that actually makes the viewing experience better. And so to them, it's like, well, why would I bother watching this? Because it's, I'll watch it and it's not very interesting because I can't access it. You see what I mean? Yeah, exactly. And I mean, in US, American football is, you know, religion. They have football Sunday. But in Sweden, when I am, I would say that most people don't know the rules of that sport. And then we look at football or yeah, soccer for the Americans. That's a world sport. It's played literally everywhere. And it's the biggest sport in the world. And when you gave some other reasons for which sports are the most popular, you mentioned that ball sports are more popular, team sports are more popular, that you have football is a team sport, it's a ball, sport with ball. So why have you found out that this is the case? So I think that, well, again, so coming back to the sort of the three criteria, so ball sports tend to be objective uh, outcome sports. Um, and then in terms of the level of, complexity and detail that can be introduced into those sports is very much increased by having a, a moving particle such as a ball which can travel around in various directions lots of things can happen with it it can be very three-dimensional um so that adds a high level of accessible detail and um, to the sport which then makes it more enjoyable i just don't think we've come up with formats of non-ball sports that can have that same level of complexity and it was interesting listening to your conversation with santiago gomez about paddle because he compared it to pickleball in the sense that um, they were both growing very, very fast, but now the growth of pickleball is slowing, whereas paddleball is continuing to go. And I think that's, again, because of the, talking about that kind of three-dimensional element of the sport, paddle's got that added layer of 
complexity and detail that it can introduce because of that 3D element, whereas pickleball is a bit more two-dimensional. And it also piggybacks on the cultural awareness of tennis because everyone kind of understands tennis because it's such a big sport. And so the threshold of bafflement for people is very high. Um, so the critical action in paddle is not going to be beyond their access because they already have an understanding of tennis. And then you get this other element of this new detail and this new complexity that makes it really interesting. And so you have a real winning formula for a sport to grow there. I haven't thought about it in those terms, but that's really interesting that you said that you take a sport that people already know and then you optimize it or you make it, you know, adding elements to make it more exciting. And that's the reason for the success. I, I, I like that. Another thing that you have mentioned is the optimization of time. And uh, for example, cricket is a huge sport in specifically in Asia, but uh, also in the UK, it's a big sport. But I mean, that sport can take hours or days sometimes. So, uh, but that still is popular. Yes, that's true. Um, so that's a very interesting one is the optimization of time, because I kind of put that in there as a, a bonus criteria. And I think it's harder to pin down in the sense that there is this kind of trend towards the popularity of short highlights packages. And in order for those to be enjoyable, it seems to be that you need to have a sport that relies on a kind of having a small number of critical moments so that you can tell the story of the sport properly in a kind of short package. So looking at a sport, so cricket is a really interesting one because obviously it's massive in countries like India. And so the kind of, Using these criteria, the explanation there would be again one, it's a it's a objective outcome sport, uh, and two, it has a high level of complexity and detail that can be introduced. And then the fact that it was introduced to India by uh, well colonial Britain, um, it therefore got this kind of historical base in which people were just naturally engaging with it because it was there. And then so you build this society that has an awareness of it and is able to access the detail of it because of their knowledge. And then that leads to that kind of self-perpetuating cultural cycle where everyone knows about it, so they enjoy it and they enjoy it more because they know about it. And then because people enjoy it, other people get involved and then they know about it and then they enjoy it and so on. So that's become massive in certain countries like that, and particularly those that have got that historical background. But I don't know where that fits with the highlights kind of package element because cricket has a high number of scoring moments and therefore, it seems it would be difficult to produce short highlights packages that properly capture the kind of drama of the story of the match. But perhaps it overcomes that just because of its pre-existing massive popularity. I don't know. It'd be interesting to see how um, how that does affect it in the future and how cricket deals with that in terms of the way it presents highlights reels and things like that. But then, and and in terms of things like twenty twenty, that's a clear. Um, sorry, again, I'm probably using language that um, as a non-crifting nation, it might be um, beyond, beyond your grasp, perhaps, but I don't know. Um, I don't want to be patronising, but equally, I don't want to talk about things that are over your head. But you have test match cricket, which can which goes over five days, and it, now you have 2020 cricket, which is uh, 120 balls, so 20 overs of six balls, so a much, much shorter format. And then in the UK, they've started something called the 100, which is a 100-ball format. Um, so there's this clear kind of compressing of the length of the game, which is to do with that optimization of time. Yeah. You can account for that my knowledge of cricket is minimal. So okay. I want for the rules. And I know about where it's, you know, more popular and all of that. But when it comes down to the rules and stuff, I'm I don't I don't know too much. So maybe I should uh, read up on that a little bit. But you mentioned a good thing there, uh, an interesting thing with the highlights, because uh, taking into the consideration you know, Gen Z, attention span, you have TikTok, like everything should be fast. I'm not sure that the young fan is watching a full game, even if it's, you know, hours and a lot of people are watching afterwards the highlights. So maybe then, as you said, with the cricket, it doesn't really harm the sport so much that it's so long, because if you're watching the highlights, it has a lot of highlight reels, a lot of great moments, and that is enough to capture the interest of that fan. Yes, potentially, potentially. And that's interesting as well is, is whether or not, I suppose, the interest in the highlights is an interest in specific individual moments of brilliance or whether it's an interest in the kind of story of the match. 
because I would argue that perhaps cricket is a hard story, that a, a cricket match is a hard story to tell in a short period, but you could easily have kind of blockbuster moments, whereas something like football, it might be easier to tell the story because there's fewer moments upon which it turns, but then perhaps fewer blockbuster moments per game. I don't know. That's an interesting one. Talking about the fans, the fan engagement trends, what do you see regarding that? Yeah, so um, so I think a lot of the things that we see in the world of fan engagement really fit into these these the sort of the second and third criteria. So increasing the level of, of detail and nuance that fans can engage with, and incre- either increasing fans' threshold of bafflement uh, by giving them a higher level of knowledge so that they can access more of it, or kind of removing barriers to preventing that. So, for example, you would speak in with. Um, Oh, what was his name? That he was involved in ice hockey, and he worked. He did lots of different roles. He was a color commentator. Ah, he Kevin Weeks. In, Kevin Weeks, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yep. Um, so he talked about all the roles that he has in the media. So in terms of providing color commentary, he described it as post-match shows, coverage from the benches, things like that. So all of this is giving a real depth of detail to to the match. So beyond just what's happening on the ice rink. He's providing that level of uh, detail in terms of who the players are, what they're about, and also explaining to those who are watching why things are happening on, in the action. So there may be action that would be beyond their threshold of bafflement, as it were, but because he's giving that explanation, it's then allowing them to go beyond that and therefore access it and therefore not have that negative impact on their viewing experience. And we see the same kind of things with these uh, these documentaries that talk about so you have for example your podcast with Dan Rappaport I was listening on my drive home today <laughs> um, talking about full swing and we've seen this in loads of different sports and it's been really positive and people have engaged with it really well and um, these documentaries is kind of fly on the wall documentaries because people again get that higher level of detail in terms of they have access to the players and their personalities and their lives and how they're training. And so when they're actually watching the sport, they've got all that going on that allows them to kind of engage more deeply with what's happening on the pitch and therefore enhancing their viewing experience. And again, giving them that knowledge that means that their threshold of bafflement uh, is much, much higher than it would have been. It's interesting with those documentaries, the kind of what will happen in the future or, or those kind of, well, I suppose there's a kind of the world of the documentaries and the individual social media content which are both kind of doing the same thing but if you look at the way it's gone with you had drive to survive looking at formula one you had a lot of amazon series that looked at american football and then a lot of series that looked at football and now they keep finding new sports they do tennis they're doing golf next up cycling coming in the summer and things like that so it seems that there's this constant search for something new and so i think in terms of fun engagement for individual sports, they really need to try and make themselves unique, find what's uniquely theirs that they're able to present. Because at the minute, there's this clear desire for a new story to tell. And that's been, that's led to the pursuit of different sports. But if an individual sport can tell lots of individual unique stories in different ways, um, then that sport will have a lot of capacity to grow. A big one would be these Hollywood owners owning Wrexham Football Club. Yeah, there's lots of all or nothing Amazon documentaries that look at different clubs and they're all fairly similar because the the clubs are kind of doing things in a fairly standardized way. And then you chuck something in like Hollywood people buying a football club and all of a sudden they're rising up through the ranks and that's a completely different story. Um, and perhaps it's it's things like that that sports need to look into to promoting about themselves, really quirky, unique features that they can bring to the fore that will set themselves apart, I suppose. Yeah, for sure. And uh, also there are a lot of, you know, celebrity backed teams nowadays, also in the NWSL, the soccer league in female soccer league in the US. They have uh, Angel City FC in the in Los Angeles. They have the ownership group with uh, Nicole Kidman and Lindsay Vaughn and, you know, all of different famous people behind it. And that also creates, you know, a bit of hype for that team. And as well, as you mentioned with uh, Wrexham there with uh, Ryan Reynolds. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Something else uh, for the fan engagement uh, that's uh, 
popular nowadays is gamification and a lot of fantasy sports together with the uh, yeah fantasy sports together with betting i would say that they go sometimes a bit hand in hand so uh, how do you see that from a fan engagement perspective and how can that help different sports yeah so um so i guess to sort of come back to where i think the value of these sort of three criteria is is using them as a framework to assess uh, innovations as to in terms of hypothesizing whether they whether or not they will be successful and so i think their success will be determined on whether they do hit these criteria and so for example we look at these kind of documentaries and we think yes that will be successful because it adds that level of detail and complexity and it increases the fans threshold of bafflement and then when you look at something like uh, the innovations in betting um, being able to bet and play on all kinds of different aspects of the game it achieves a similar thing. It hits that second criteria of adding that detail into which fans can engage. Um, and then gamification does the same kind of thing. It allows for that kind of um, added level of access into a sport. And uh, some very interesting ones, which um, it'd be intriguing to see how they impact things in the future. Things like Zwift, um, which is a, a cycling software uh, where people ride on a turbo trainer and it gives them their power and things like that. And they can compete against each other virtually as if they were in a cycling race. And then cycling as a sport can then harness this kind of engagement and look at how can we present a cycling race whereby um, you know fans are able to engage with the sport by virtually riding the same course and they can see the site, the 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 athletes power that they're producing and compare it to their own and things like that. So that's a very interesting innovation in the world of kind of gamifying sports. And fundamentally, I think it all boils down to this, this idea of really bringing that, that deep access to the, the detail of what's going in the sport to the fan. And so, yeah, using that second and third criteria as a framework to assess these things, I don't think they necessarily allow for, well, they, they provide a background from which to create potential ideas. But then I think their real value is in if someone produces an idea, can we assess that according to these criteria? Does it meet these criteria? And if so, maybe it's a goer. And if not, perhaps we need to reconsider it. So do you think it's more important for individual sports or not ball sports? You know, the sports that they were not highest on the other criteria, is it more important for them with the fan engagement aspects in order to attract the fans? since they might have it more difficult on the other criteria? Yes, very much so. Um, but I think they're always going to be fighting a challenging battle because the, the sports that achieve the objectivity criteria can then still do their own fan engagement innovations in the same kind of way and maintain that kind of superiority. So I think it is very challenging. But you look at Usain Bolt, for example. Athletics was hugely reliant on his personality and charisma that engaged fans because that gave them that particular detail they could engage with. Everyone was engaged with him as an individual, his life story and his character, which made the sport much more popular. Now he's gone, it's struggling and it continues with this cycle of trying to look for these particular individuals to, to kind of latch on to. And if you hear Michael Johnson speaking about this, he kind of is, I would say, pessimistic about this approach because he doesn't think it's sustainable because there, there will be superstars in other sports. And so the sport itself has to try and innovate. And with those, I think it's a case of actually looking at different formats. And I don't know, well, we can engage in a bit of um, kind of blue sky thinking if you want about what things, what could be done. But I think an interesting one could be something like, because so uh, the problem with, I think the problem that track and field faces is that there is a kind of low superficial level of detail to be engaged with because for most people, well, it's so tied to the objective outcome. And so the Olympics and the world championships are engaging because that objective outcome becomes more interesting because it's things like the Olympic gold medal or a world record, which are big, interesting outcomes that have a lot of history um, and detail attached to them that people can engage with. But when you remove that and you just have the kind of general events, then it's really struggling because all it is is who's faster than this other person on the particular day. And there's not a lot more to, to get involved in. And I wonder whether there's some sort of best of three or best of five format that could be introduced. That's very much a blue sky idea, but 
with these characters like Michael Johnson talking about how the sport desperately needs to innovate, um, then maybe something like that could be something to pursue or experiment with. And things like the mixed relay, I think, is a, a great innovation that conjured up a, a huge amount of interest and publicity in the sport. Um, so it's being willing to take the risk to try those interesting things, I think, that sports like that need to do. Evolve or die, I've heard some people say in different uh, areas of business and stuff like that. So same here, you know, as you said, that you cannot rely on one athlete because when that athlete gets injured or retires or whatever, then what foundation do you have to stand on? I like that. And some other blue sky thinking that you have on top of mind for this struggling sports. Yeah, okay. Well, so, I mean, so a sport that is of big interest to me personally, and it's a little bit different because this is a sport that has objective outcomes, but, and again, this is quite UK centric, so I apologize, but rugby, there's rugby union and there's rugby league and rugby union is the, the one that most of the world knows and is the bigger of the two. And they split off, uh, well, there were historical reasons for their, their division, but rugby league in the UK essentially occupies a very small area of the north of England in kind of post-industrial towns in the north. And it's definitely the smaller of the two. But rugby union is really struggling at the minute in terms of there are big financial problems with lots of different leagues um, and lots of clubs are struggling. And there's this big concern over head injuries and um, the impact that's having on athletes in the future. And rugby league as a minority sport, I think has an opportunity to, to innovate and try and um, capture some of the people that may be being lost to rugby union potentially. So in terms of looking at uh, this idea of the kind of social media or documentary content that um, captures a unique element of a sport. Um, so what rugby league has done historically is it's tried to spread into regions kind of outside of its heartlands where people aren't familiar with the sport, like into London, and that's not been successful. And I think it needs to focus in on itself and look at the interesting cultural and historical elements of its kind of post-industrial northern landscape that it lives in and try and really promote that and and buy into its its own unique character um because i think that would achieve some engagement and provide that that different story you know that there's constantly being searched for in the world of sport also there's an opportunity for trying to engage because there's a lot of uh i suppose deprived areas in rugby league's heartlands and if there was some sort of social action around trying to get young people involved in the sport and try and provide opportunities um, in that sense, that again, that could, I mean, in a cynical perspective, you could say, oh, it's an interesting marketing tool, but then it serves a dual purpose of boosting the sport and also trying to serve some kind of social purpose. And then uh, the other one is, so touch rugby, which is a, a non-collision version of the sport, it kind of alienates ex-rugby players because it's very, very different. It's superficially similar, but uh, the actual playing of the game is very different. And I wonder whether an innovation in that space into a kind of non-contact version of the sport could be introduced to capture some of the people that are being lost to the different forms of rugby because of the head injury concerns and then channel them into the rugby league world to generate more interest in that sport and kind of boost its own profile. Mm, interesting. The head injuries have been, you know, in many sports, American football and uh, ice hockey as well. Yeah, even football now. Yeah, foot, yeah, true. Well, the head in the ball. Yeah. Is there something that uh, we haven't, uh, that I haven't asked you or we haven't mentioned yet that you think is uh, of value to bring up? Well, talking about these criteria and the, it's an interesting one because they've kind of just come out of observations of sport and observations of the world of sport and which ones are more popular and less popular. And so it's, there's no sort of exact science there. But uh, I think it's an interesting exercise um, for people who are interested in the world of sport and in innovations in sport and what makes different sports more compelling than others. Because that's the that's what this is, these criteria are about. It's about what makes one sport more compelling than another. And so kind of going back through um, historical examples or for yourself, looking back at previous podcasts, because looking back, so I've, I've managed to mention a, a few of them and how they all kind of tie in, looking at Dan Rappaport with Full Swing and looking at, uh, so it was an interesting one with Emil Sotovsky and um, talking about chess. So he, he argued, you asked him, is chess a sport? And he said, oh, chess is more of a sport than gymnastics is. 
um, because he talked about and he he basically hit on the objectivity criteria. Now that's a it's a different question as to whether that is what defines a sport and whether it's required to be objective in order to be considered sport. And that's not necessarily what I'm arguing, but he's still hitting on the same thing. In order for that, well, one of those sort of criteria for it to be really compelling is that objectivity element. So I think the more that, well, it's an interesting exercise to kind of have these criteria in your head and assess things that have happened or things that you've perceived in the world of sport uh, on the basis of that and see how they kind of all do seem to tie in. Yeah, definitely. And that was an interesting episode that actually took off more than I expected and uh, was newspapers writing about it because he's, he has very strong opinions about many of the things that I asked him and that, uh, that made some uh, headlines in Norway and Denmark in the newspapers there. So, uh, but uh, I, because I, you know, most people, if you ask that they, they are not playing chess, if chess is a sport, I think most people would say no. And for that reason, I asked him that. And of course, what you said, it's the outcome element that he pointed on but also that he argued that it was also, it is physical and that you need to sit for a long time. And I mean, that can be argued, of course, how physical that is. It's not the same as basketball or football or whatever. But IOC has their uh, requirements for what is a sport. He believes that they lived up to that, but they are not an Olympic sport. So, you know, you can go back and forth on that one. So yeah. I think that was an interesting one for sure. Yeah. The best, the best argument I've ever heard for chess not being a sport it was a, from a book called The Philosophy of Sport, and I can't remember who wrote it, but he, was, he made the case that because you could tell a completely untrained individual to do a move in chess, and they could execute the actual movement of moving that piece 100% every time in the same way that a grandmaster would, in the sense that it would just be moving one piece to, from one position to another position. So obviously their decision procedure in the sport would be completely different. They wouldn't be able to do it themselves in terms of coming up with the right move to make. But if they were told, do that move, then they would do it, despite having no chess skill whatsoever. Whereas in something like football, you couldn't say, hit that volley into the top left corner, and they could do it. They might be able to do it once, but they were in 100 goes. And that was, um, I think, that was an interesting one in terms of trying to come up with a criteria for defining sport. But equally, it's an interesting thought piece, but... Is it worth trying to tell people that their thing isn't a sport? I don't know, maybe not. <laughs> maybe that's um, a bit of a controversial road to go down, perhaps. Yeah. I'm trying to think of another sport that that would be possible. That if you can do something exactly the same, if someone just told you what to do, but I can think of something now on top of my head. But, you know, then we have esports. That, yeah. uh, is that that's also, is that a sport? Because it's not, you know, physical in that sense. But then people argue for the hand-eye coordination that it is, I couldn't do that moves that they are doing on the computer or whatever on the, when they play the game. So on that argument, that would be a sport. Yeah. That's the interesting one, eh? Yeah, it is. It seems like arbitrary sometimes. Just sort of, does it matter if it is a sport or not? But I mean, when, it, when you take it one level down, in Sweden at least, you get state funding if you're in a, a registered sport. So you're getting more money to your sport from the government that you can invest in growing that sport or whatever you want to do with that. So it has value with a classification of if it is a sport or not. Yeah, definitely. And just, um, I suppose one last thing, cause you were saying if there was anything you hadn't asked, um, just on that point of the kind of gray area of defining a sport, you know, you say I have this sort of catchy title of what makes a sport better than another. And it's all about what makes one more compelling than another. Now, I think that they capture the broad preferences, but I think there are lots of gray areas where it, so for example, it can say, well, football will, is, and will always be more popular than uh, gymnastics or uh, ice hockey is, and will be more popular than dancing because they fulfill these three criteria in a much clearer way than these other ones do. However, when it comes to much closer comparisons, it's much more complicated. So while they, they capture those broad preferences, they don't necessarily capture the, the closer ones. And certainly one individual's subject ex experience of a sport will, so, so for example, I will genuinely enjoy watching a game of rugby to a higher level. I'll, I'll receive a greater level of enjoyment watching that than you would. And you would receive a higher level of watching hockey than I would. And it's not to say that rugby is better than hockey or hockey is better than rugby but it's because of our individual knowledges that means that the level of detail that we're able to access 
that leads to our actual experiences being better. So there are certainly lots of gray areas, but the, the criteria capture the broad preferences. Interesting. So what is the best sport? Uh, well, the best sport is one that is objective and has a high <laughs> level of detail that you are able to access uh, and where you can follow all the critical action. So it's, it is still a subjective thing, but it has to, has to hit those, those criteria. All right. <laughs> I always close the podcast with the same questions for the guest, And it is, if you could choose the next guest on this podcast, who do you think I should talk to? Uh, so I think one, speak to someone from rugby league, um, and see if they're coming up with any innovations, um, and talk to them about non-contact versions of the sport to try and hook people in. I think that'd be a good one. And then equally, because they were how we got in touch, speak to Deloitte sport in the middle East, because they're doing some interesting things out in uh, Dubai and, uh, yeah, they, that's a, a world of big change and big innovation in sport. So I'm sure there'll be lots of. Uh, interesting insight to be getting there. For sure. David, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the Sports Management Podcast. Thank you. Loved it. Nice to speak with you. Thank you for listening to the Sports Management Podcast. Please hit the subscribe button so you don't miss out on any upcoming episodes. Also, feel free to leave a comment about what you thought about this episode. If you want to get in contact with me, send an email to sportsmpodcast at gmail.com or hit me up on Facebook, Twitter or Instagram at sportsmpodcast.